And Your Honor, if I may, can um, can the defense specify on the record what exactly they are looking to exclude um, or what their motions are um, based on? Just I'm, to be I'm clear glad. on what we're arguing today. Yeah, so we have filed motions uh, that address the admissibility of the blood test. We have filed a motion to exclude chemical test results, uh, essentially uh, based upon the admissibility provisions of 40-6-392-A1A. We have filed a Daubert motion to exclude toxicology evidence. Uh, again, since the statute changed last year by the General Assembly, any party wishing to enter scientific evidence uh, at trial is now required to do it under 24-7-702. Uh, we've also filed a separate motion regarding the admissibility of any field sobriety tests also pursuant to that statute 24-7-702. Thank you. We previously filed in our initial motions, um, sorry, just two separate places here. Uh, motion to exclude field sobriety tests, motion to exclude. Motion detected at front door. Uh, defendant's alleged refusal to take an ALCA sensor. Uh, Motion to exclude the horizontal gaze and nystagmus test. And motion to exclude all evidence gathered as a result of an unlawful seizure. So those are the motions that the, the last three or four were filed back in July of 2021. The initial three were updated motions that were filed in January, um, essentially reflecting the change in the law regarding the admissibility of scientific evidence. State's ready? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, um, Sergeant Watts, yes, raise your right hand for me. You solemnly swear or affirm any testimony you give in this matter will be true. Yes. How many times in your have you, approximately, have you conducted a walk and turn test? Well over 60. And what exactly are you looking for when you when you conduct this test? Um, I'm looking for uh, a set of clues. How many clues? Eight. And can you briefly describe what those clues are? Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm looking for uh, if they stop walking within the first nine or the second nine, um, that we consider one clue total uh, for both passes. Uh, Your Honor, it appears that the witness is reading from a document. I would ask that if he needs to refresh his recollection, he do that and testify from his memory rather than reading off of the document what the clues are. It's hard for me to, it's hard for me to refresh my memory, Your Honor, from three years ago. No, 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 no. I'm not asking you to refresh your memory on what happened three years ago. I'm asking you not to refresh your recollection on your training on what the clues on the walk and turn test are. Amen. Those... Amen. Damn. Who said amen? I don't know, but I muted you before. I'm going to need you to stay muted. Do that again yeah. and we're going to have some problems. Judge, if I need to clarify my objection, I'm happy uh, to. You do don't that. have to clarify. Um, the stuff that you should know from your training, you don't need to refresh. Um, anything else, if you have to re uh, reflect on it, then you can refresh, but don't read from it. Got it. I believe the question was, what are the eight clues on the walk and turn test? Unable to balance, step, step offline, uh, starts too soon, uh, missed heel to toe, and the actual number of steps. Now and are it, you re oh sorry, go ahead. Um I think I got them all. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, what uh, what instructions do you give uh, when administering this test? Um, I I ask the same questions. I medically qualify them. Ask them if you have any problem bending, standing, walking, or uh, anything to prevent from, uh, from from performing this test. And I give an example of the test. Uh, first, I start with telling them. I put him in the stance and uh, I tell him to remain in. Sorry. I give him an example. Uh, I first I explain to him that uh, that he's going to leave his lead foot planted, place the right heel in front of his, his left toe. Uh, looking down at his feet, he's going to count out loud with each step. One, two, three, four, and so on to nine. Leave lead foot planted, taking serious small steps, turning around. One, two, three, four, and so on to nine. And are these the same instructions that you give in every DUI investigation where you administer this test? Yes. During the administration of this test, uh, were you able to observe how the defendant performed? Yes. What um, did you did you observe any clues um, from the eight that you mentioned previously? Yes, I did. And what were those clues? I'll have to refer to my report. Is that okay? If you need to take a second, yes. Just let me know when you're finished. All right. Okay. And what were the clues that you observed? Improper number of steps, first steps, uh, first nine, he took 10 steps. Second nine, uh, second eight steps, he took 13 steps. And uh, he was unable to balance, missed his heel to toe. And uh, he missed steps 10, 11, 12. He, he did 10, 11, 12, 13 steps, and he broke his stance. So, so in total, a, how many how many clues is that? Total four. And does your training get, provide you um, in what at what point there's an indicator of a impairment based on those clues? Four more clues. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your answer. Four more clues. I'm sorry, Judge. I had trouble hearing that. It cut out. Was that four or more clues? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. So, based on your training and experience, um, was the defendant's performance on the walk and turn in, an indicator of an indication that he was impaired? Yes. Now, do you recognize this still shot? Yes. And what, what is this still shot? Uh, that's seven bar grill. Um, that's the patio area. And is this um, is this still shot um, part of your video from the night of October 22nd, 2020? Yes. And to your knowledge, is this a fair and accurate depiction of the the scene that night? Yes. And does this appear to have been changed or altered in any way? No. And your honors, state's gonna move this in a state's one. Any is objection, this, Mr. Hawkins? Yes, I'm unclear. This appears to be a video, but is the state moving this in as a photograph? No, I'm just having him identify it as the same video. Oh. Okay, so all he's identified is that this appears to be a screenshot or a photograph from the video. Uh, objection to lack of foundation for establishing that the video is a true, fair and accurate representation, Your Honor. Go ahead and play some of it. Sergeant Watts, based on the what was just played, do you recognize this 
vi this video. Yes, ma'am. And what does this video depict? Um, the night that um, I encountered Mr. Turnbull. And to your knowledge, this is a fair and accurate depiction of um, the events that occurred that were captured on the video? Yes, ma'am. And does it appear that this video um, has been changed or altered in any way? No. You're right, this time the state's going to tender the video and it's state's one. Mr. Hawkins, any objection? May I forward the witness briefly, Your Honor? You may. Uh, Sergeant, when's the last time you reviewed this video? Uh, probably because I wasn't able to get access from it. So probably the week that I made the arrest. Okay, and so the week that you made the arrest would have been after the week after October 22nd, 2020? Yes, that's correct. You have not reviewed this video since then by yourself? No. You have not reviewed it with the prosecutor? No. You have not reviewed, it appears to be just short of an hour, 58 minutes and 33 seconds. Am I accurate in asking you this? The only thing that you've seen is that screenshot at the beginning and then the nine seconds that was just played. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Um, are you capable of testifying that this video in its 58 minutes and 33 seconds without having reviewed it is a fair and uh, accurate representation of the 58 minutes and 33 seconds that you captured on your dash cam? Um, the few minutes or seconds that I just viewed, yes. Okay, so you can tell us that the few seconds that you viewed are an accurate representation of what you saw when you pulled up, but you have not reviewed the 58 minute and 33 seconds, have you? No. So you can't truthfully say that the video in its entirety is a fair and accurate representation of what you filmed that night. Agreed? I agree. That's all I have, Your Honor. All right. Anything else from the state? Yes, Your Honor. Um, The witness actually testified that he watched this video the week of the arrest, so he has seen the video. Um, furthermore, it it would appear that the defense is attempting to say that he can't speak to the authenticity of the video and whether or not it it is a fair and accurate depiction because he hasn't seen the entirety, which he did testify that he did um, without having played it right now for him. And it doesn't seem as though we are trying to, it seems as though we're trying to, from my understanding that the video needs, I'm guessing needs to be played in its entirety first before he can identify it, which could defeat the purpose of me questioning whether or not he can speak to the authenticity of the video, which he just did. So um, I, I, to be quite frank, I'm not really sure what the defense is trying to get at with their one of your questions. Anything else, Mr. Hawkins? Yes, Your Honor. A video is no different than a series of individual photographs, Your Honor. And any party seeking to enter a document, a photograph, a videotape, anything of that nature, if the witness is to identify and state under oath uh, that is a fair and accurate depiction of what it purports to be, requires that witness to testify that they have familiarity with it and that it is in fact a fair and accurate depiction. Uh, the sergeant was truthful in saying it's been about three years since he's reviewed this video. You recall that he said during his testimony that he's had to review his report because he didn't remember a number of things and he's had to refresh his recollection. He indicated that he uh, has not been able to gain access uh, to review this video for the last, um, you know, I, I'd say two and a half to three years uh, to be able to testify truthfully. As a general proposition, Judge, I think what we're used to is there would be some preparation in advance if uh, a party wants to enter a piece of evidence, document, photograph, you know, video, whatever the case may be, would uh, allow the witness to review prior to the hearing 
any evidence that they want to admit. And so the truth for the the uh, sergeant, I should say, has truthfully testified that he cannot state that this is a fair and accurate representation based upon his memory from almost three years ago. And as such, the state is not able to lay the foundation for the admissibility of this piece of evidence, and we object. Well, and your objection is overruled, but if you wanted to play the whole video before it's admitted, I'm fine with that too. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Go ahead. And just for the record, um, has the video been admitted? Video's been admitted. And, and Judge, I would just like my objection to be continuing that this witness has truthfully testified that he cannot assure the court that it is a true and accurate representation uh, of what it allegedly purports to be. And that is a blatant uh, shortcoming for the party seeking to enter this piece of evidence. And we would ask that our objection be continuing based upon those grounds. Your objection can be continuing. That's fine with me. Um, but if the purpose of authenticating the video is that you wish to make sure that it is a fair and accurate representation, then just as we would do with pictures, the only way to um, make sure that it is a fair and accurate representation um, for the for the basis of uh, laying a foundation is to let him look at it, just like we would do each individual picture that he would testify to. So let's run it. Sergeant Watts has some clarifying questions. Now, in the video, you it appears that you've turned off your the or the blue lights that were on were turned off. Did did you turn those lights off? Yes. And can you recall why you turned the lights off? Uh, yes, I, I I turn those off uh, whenever performing a uh, field sobriety. To prevent the flashing of the eyes uh, and no interference while performing HGN. And the implied consent notice that you read, how did you determine that Mr. Turnbull was over the age of 21? By his driver license that was presented to me. Thank you. I don't have any further questions at this time, Your Honor. Uh, yeah, uh, Sergeant Watts, I'm Mike Hawkins. I'm not sure that we've met before. Good to meet you. Sure. Um, and just to clarify, was I accurate when I spoke to the judge and said that the last time you saw this video was a week after October of 2020 when the arrest took place? Yes, sir. Okay. You were able to review the video here today, correct? Yes. And from I know you're on Zoom like I am, you weren't able to hear any sound on it. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, but it did appear to be what you remember seeing. Is that right? Yes. E even though it didn't capture any of the conversation with Mr. Turnbull, you, you, you believe it's fair and accurate. Is that right? Yes, I do. And uh, it did have sound. If you look on the video, that was me picking up my mic. Yeah, I, I understand. So, uh, you previously testified that um, Mr. Turnbull, it was reported to you, had backed into a patrol car with its blue lights on. Do you remember testifying to that? Yes, that's correct. Okay. It's actually an unmarked patrol car that doesn't have blue lights after you reviewed the video. Did that refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. So but this is... That, that vehicle does have blue lights. Um, okay. They, but, they maybe not on after I responded, but I was told that it was the blue lights were on. All right, but you never saw any blue lights on, correct? No. And in the video, we don't see any blue lights on, correct? No. And you created an accident report for this case, correct? Yes. Do you agree that where the vehicles were at the time that you arrived was not where the vehicles were? at the time that what you described the crash took place? Uh, vehicle number two was where the crash took place. Vehicle number one being uh, Mr. Turnbull's vehicle was okay. not where it occurred. Okay. Uh, and you weren't there when the, the accident took place, correct? That's correct. 
Are you aware that Mr. Turnbull was waiting in his vehicle for what he described was his girl to come out of the the restaurant, bar and grill, whatever it is? Uh, no, Mr. Turnbull stated on video that uh, he went back in the restaurant to get his girl. Okay, and, uh, and then came back out. Okay, you recall came that? Back out. Do you recall yes. that he said that when he came back out, he was waiting inside his vehicle for his girl to come back out? Yes. Something okay. to that. And so what happened was Mr. Turnbull had gone into the club looking for his girl. And do you remember a discussion with him about how they would not let him out the front door? They made him go out through the side door. Do you recall that? I don't recall that. Okay. But that he came out and was waiting in his vehicle and then apparently while he was sitting in his vehicle, this Clayton County unmarked patrol vehicle came up to the scene. Do you recall learning that? No. Okay. So you don't recall sufficiently whether or not this was a situation where Mr. Turnbull was sitting in his car, an unmarked patrol vehicle came up and parked behind him, and that's when he backed up into it. Do you recall whether that's how this took place or not? No. I um, what I recall is uh, that vehicle, as was stated to me from Deputy Story, that it was parked and Mr. Turnbull reversed into his vehicle. Okay, well, it couldn't have been parked because you were the one that drew this. Let me turn my thing off here. Give me just a second here. You drew this, correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's not in a parking space. It's actually sitting out in the middle of the roadway behind Mr. Turnbull's vehicle. Do you agree with that? Uh, that's correct. And that was parked there blocking the drive because that's private property. And if that owner of that establishment has hired that deputy and want that vehicle parked there, they can park it there. All right. But the, the vehicle was parked after Mr. Well, let's back up for a minute. Mr. Turnbull could not have gotten into that parking space if that unmarked patrol vehicle was there prior to his arrival, correct? I can't, I can't speak on that. So Mr. Turnbull must have parked in the parking space and then the unmarked vehicle came up and you use the term parked. I would say, you know, parked his vehicle in the middle of the roadway outside this club. You recall that? I remember the vehicle being parked there. Yes. Okay. You also described at the outset that Mr. Turnbull had trouble standing. Do you agree that we were able to observe throughout the entirety of this video, Mr. Turnbull was standing just fine while you were giving him instructions? Yeah, that's, he had a circle sway while I was giving him um, instruction. It was visible on video. And also he walked away from camera when he was explaining and going and getting items out of his vehicles when he stumbled and had, was unsteady on his feet. And are you that saying that that captured was captured on the video, that he stumbled? That was not captured on the video. But you saw that somewhere where we could not see it on the video, correct? That's correct. When I asked you about the walk and turn test, I have a couple questions about that. Okay. You indicated that according to your training, well, let's back up for a minute. When's the last time you had field sobriety testing training? Had a refresher maybe two years ago. Two years ago, was that at Gypstick? Yes. Okay. And did you feel like that refresher course helped you revisit what your training was for standardized field sobriety testing? Yes. Okay. Um, you indicated that Four out of eight clues is enough for you to make the arrest decision on a walk and turn test. You testified to that today. Do you recall that? Yes. Is it more accurate that what you're trained is that any two out of eight clues is sufficient on a walk and turn for you to make the arrest decision? It is, uh, but I like to make solid cases, Ms. Hawkins. So okay, so I you arrest somebody with two clues. Okay, so you disregard the standardized field sobriety training that is uh, is provided by the National Highway Traffic Safety. Um, Your Honor, I'm going to object to that question. It's argumentative. I haven't finished my question, Your Honor. Finish your question. Have you disregarded the standardized field sobriety testing training that is provided by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and instead you apply four clues rather than what you're trained as two? 
And Your Honor, I, again, I, I, I'm raising my objection that that question is argumentative. We can ask the get the answer. Let him ask. Go ahead, sir. You can answer. Sergeant Watts. You can yes, answer, sir. sir. You can answer the question. So that'll be no. Okay. So when I asked you, when I asked for permission from the judge to question you uh, about that, um, you indicated that the training that you received, that was the question that I asked you, is how many that, that do you need to, to have the arrest decision? Or that, that, I'm sorry, that's what the prosecutor asked you. And your answer was that the training you received was four out of eight clues. Do you recall that? Yes. And that would have been inaccurate because it's actually two out of eight clues, correct? Yes. I also asked you during my voir dire to uh, list, if you would, without refreshing your recollection through your notes or without reading through your notes, what the eight clues on the walk and turn test were. Do you recall me asking you that? Yes. How many clues did you identify in your answer? Four. Okay. So you did not, I see you look up here, please. I don't want you looking at your report, sir. You identified uh, only four clues out of eight that you could recall without having to look at your uh, report. Do you agree with that? Yes. You are a sergeant. In my experience, Sergeant Watts, not a lot of sergeants in the state patrol make DUI cases. How many DUI cases have you made since Mr. Turnbull's arrest? I can't give you an accurate number, but I have made DUI arrests since then. I, mean, I was promoted are, shortly after. Am I right that you're a supervisor when you're a sergeant? Is that accurate? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So it's mostly the troopers first class or the troopers, you know, general troopers that are the ones making most of the DUIs out on the road. Is that accurate? Yes, and I was okay. not a supervisor at the time of this arrest three years ago. <laughs> okay. I understand. Uh, were you a sergeant back then? No. When were you promoted to sergeant? I Sorry? Was I was promoted to corporal shortly after that. Okay. That very next month in Baldwin County, I became corporal. And then when did you become a sergeant? I became a sergeant in... November of 21. Okay. The prosecutor repeatedly asked you questions in this manner. How many clues does it take to be an indicator of impairment? And you would give your answer. Do you recall the prosecutor asking you that? Yes. I want to ask you a very specific question. So please listen to my question carefully. Would you agree that the NHTSA training you received in field sobriety testing is not designed to determine if a person is impaired, but rather is designed to determine by a number of clues that you see a likelihood whether the person is above a 0.08? Yes. Okay. Uh, would you agree also with me? Let me ask you this. Do you recall who Marceline Burns is? Do you recall no. that? Okay. No. Do you recall in your training, and did you receive your training at the Georgia Public Safety Training Center? Yes. Do you remember who the training officers were when you received your training? No, ma'am. I mean, no, sir. I apologize. No worries. Um, do you recall being taught that field sobriety testing has never been validated for impairment, but rather has been validated to determine if above a person has a likelihood of being above the legal limit? Do you recall that? Yes. So when the prosecutor asked you um, how many clues it took to indicate that Mr. Turnbull was impaired, your answers were actually to the question, how many clues does it take to determine the arrest decision that the person could be above a 0.08? Do you agree with that? Yes. And just one more time, just I don't think I heard it. I tried to write it down. Who did you say that the registered nurse was that drew the blood for Mr. Turnbull? Was it R? A, 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 I tried to write it down. A Stellen? A Strelin? It's the first name R. Estrell. E S T R E L L. Okay. Judge, that's all I have. Okay. Redirect. Yes, ma'am.
Uh, Sergeant, I understand that you're you're trained on there only being the indicators of impairment started two out of eight clues um, for the walk and turn. Why did why have you made the decision to make your indicators four out of eight? It just wasn't. It's just that um, on the walk and turn, um, sometimes, like you know, some sometimes people have a hard time, uh, you know, balancing, and so that was one of his things. So the more the merrier, the more the clues the merrier. I don't have anything further. Your Honor. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Other witnesses from the state? No, Your Honor. Any witnesses from the defense? Defense rest, Your Honor. All right, argument. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll defer, Your Honor. All right. Judge, is the state's burden of proof. I would ask that the, since it is the state's burden that they uh, argue first and we be able to respond. Ms. Williams? Uh, I do have... Uh, I do have the well, I do have the burden. Um, I also have the opportunity to open and rebut. So I would ask to just rebut. Judge, that's in close that's in closing argument by statute. That's not an emotions hearing on the admissibility of evidence. Y'all yeah. just want me to make the decision without hearing from our hearing argument because I can do that. I'm, I'm happy to argue, Judge, but the 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 rules as I understand them. Or that who, the party in a motions hearing on evidence, whoever has the burden, has is required to argue first. But if you want to hear from me, I'm happy to address the court, Your Honor. I will uh, follow oh, yeah, your. Oh yes, ma'am. Your Honor, based on the testimony that was presented here today, um, and taking the arguments, uh, or the motions in turn. The starting with the HGN test, the uh, the trooper testified to the fact that he has been provided training in the a standard standardized field sobriety test given by the National Highway Safety um, Authority, and that in his training he is to utilize subjects who are under the influence of alcohol. At different or various stages in order to determine their level of impairment and that he also um, has refresher courses and that um, his most recent refresher is two years ago actually and so it, his testimony today was that he uh, based on the training that he received he observed six out of six clues uh, on the hgn test and that um, he saw the lack of smooth pursuit in both eyes, the maximum deviation at 45 degrees, as well as the involuntary jerkiness, giving him the indication that Mr. Turnbull um, was likely impaired, um, in which he also testified that four or more clues is an indicator that um, the subject was likely at a 0.08 or more, um, and clues higher than that indicate that the subject could potentially be or 0 0.10 or more. Um, and based on his training, that was the indications he got from the six out of six clues that he was above the legal limit. Uh, the, uh, in the defense's motion, they argued that the officer was not properly trained or, or the fact that he failed to administer the test um, in the manner in which that he was trained. I would, I would submit that he did in fact perform his test sufficiently um, and in compliance with his training, um, as he also testified to, um, and as uh, we also saw on the video, um, and that he did administer his test in the manner in which he was trained in. And so based on, based on his testimony and um, his experience, he, the um, the HGN test should be admissible at trial. Now, speaking to 
the defendant's alleged refusal, the I would I would submit that based on the video and the testimony, there is no refusal. He uh, agreed to take the state administered chemical test of his blood, and that the officer did um, did comply with the procedures in um, a totality of the circumstances prior to arrest, making the arrest, and then reading implied consent uh, within a reasonable time after his uh, after his arrest. Based on what was seen in the video um, and what was given, he um, he testified the, um, the clues and the mannerisms that he observed during the standard field sobriety test, as well as the odor of the alcohol, the swaying, uh, and the and his bloodshot eyes, and his slurred speech, um, making the decision to arrest. And then after he placed him under arrest. Um, he did a, pro, um, a preliminary pat down and search um, incident to that arrest to ensure his safety. And as soon as he verified that he, um, he was safe, he took out the green compliance, the green implied consent card um, and did read it verbatim. He also, um, when the when it appeared the defendant um, did, not, did not initially um, understand, he read it, uh, he asked him again if he understood that, if he understood what he had just read to him, um, he also verified that he was over the age of 21 based on the license given by investigator story. And that so and based on that, the um, the implied uh, consent notice was read properly. And uh, after asking if he understood it twice, he, he did it, the um, trooper testified that he did agree to the state administered chemical test. Therefore, I would uh, submit to the court that there is no refusal uh, in this case. Based on what was presented, um, I believe that the state has met its burden. Um, in this case, as a proponent of the evidence that the officer had the, um, did perform the HGN test in, in uh, substantial compliance with his training, he did perform it correctly, and that the implied consent notice was read properly after um, there was a, a probable cause for the arrest in which the defendant did agree to take the test and that there was no refusal. And so I would ask at this time that you deny the defense's motion and, and not exclude the evidence in this case. All right, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Judge, to be clear, the, the evidence regarding the refusal has to do with the allegation that Mr. Turnbull refused to submit to the ALCA sensor. Um, and judge, in that regard, we would cite uh, State versus Bradbury. That's B-R-A-D-B-E-R-R-Y. It's going to be found at 357 Georgia Appeals 60. Uh, that decision was affirmed uh, and in uh, a more recent case, Ammons versus State, that's A-M-M-O-N-S versus State, found at 315 Georgia, 149. Um, any allegation that a defendant has refused to submit to not just an ALCA sensor in Bradbury, but any field sobriety test is no longer admissible in Georgia courts in recognizing that a defendant in Georgia has a constitutional right to decline to provide evidence against himself. I would simply ask the court to review those two cases uh, and exclude any evidence of the alleged refusal to submit to the preliminary breath test. So now, Judge, saying, yes, I'd take the test, but not participating by not blowing into the test is considered a refusal? That's the allegation, yes. Uh, that was the testimony today, Judge, is that he was refusing to provide a breath sample um, and I think the trooper said that he kept placing his tongue over it, um, at the time that he was requesting him to blow into it. So we would ask the court to review Bradbury and Ammons and exclude, uh, any evidence of an alleged refusal to submit to an ALCA sensor. Um, I'd like to address if I could judge, um, our motions to exclude the toxicology evidence and motions to exclude the chemical test results. Um, okay. Judge. The state did not offer into evidence at the motions hearing, which is required by law. 
any evidence of defendant's blood test. They did not offer under 40-6-392E as an echo, one, two, or three. Um, any certification from the blood drawer, any temp testimony under oath from the blood drawer, or any testimony from a blood drawer supervisor or of a medical records custodian. Um, the person that the trooper mentioned, I had to ask him twice. Let me just find that. The name was Estrell, R Estrell, E S T R E L L. There's been no testimony uh, under 40 6 392 E1 from her. There's been no testimony from a supervisor or from any uh, records custodian. Um, in addition, Your Honor, 40 6 392 A1A uh, requires the state. Uh, it's their burden of proof to demonstrate that the blood test was performed according to methods approved by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Division of Forensic Sciences. No witness from the crime lab from the GBI DFS testified here today. Uh, so there is uh, essentially no evidence from the blood drawer and no evidence from the blood tester uh, that is required under 40-6-392 to make the test admissible. On those statutory grounds, we would ask the court to exclude uh, the blood test evidence from this case. In addition, Your Honor, we would ask the court to consider this case. Uh, this is a sort of a second layer of inadmissibility, if you will, and that is Miller versus State, found at 238 Georgia Appeals 61. Um, and this regards the implied consent notice. And, and Judge, I'll just review what I observed was the evidence in this case. What I observed the evidence in this case regarding implied consent was that the trooper, the, the sergeant, testified that he read implied consent and that he read it from a green card. No evidence of the substance of the implied consent in the green card has been provided to the court. And if you'll review Miller versus State, it will tell the court <clears throat> what I believe the court already knows, there are several ways the state can meet its burden here. One is by testimony from the witness as to what was read. The other is by offering the card itself into evidence um, so that the actual document would be uh, part of the record. And then the third way is to run video with audio on it, which could reveal what was actually read to the defendant. In this case, Your Honor, none of those things uh, were offered into evidence by the state. So in addition to the absence of evidence from the crime lab, from the nurse, there's also a failure to even before we even get to those witnesses that were not called, that is the state has to meet its burden by demonstrating the substance of the implied consent notice. And in particular, what the cases will tell us, Your Honor, is that there has to be an affirmative showing that the defendant was advised of his right to independent testing. That's the that's the substance of the the Miller case, and saying that it's a green card and and um, I, I didn't hear any questioning about did you read it in its entirety. I, I listened for that. I didn't hear it. the prosecutor argued it, but even saying yes, I read it in its entirety without submitting the card into evidence, the court has nothing uh, before it to determine what the substance of what was read uh, to Mr. Turnbull. And so on those additional grounds, Your Honor, we would ask the court to exclude the blood test because there's no evidence of the implied consent substance offered into evidence today. Finally, Your Honor, as it regards the field sobriety test, including the horizontal gaze nystagmus, Judge, we filed a separate motion placing the state on notice that we intended to exercise Mr. Turnbull's rights that uh, evidence of field sobriety tests the state must demonstrate pursuant to 24-7-702 that these field sobriety tests that were performed, um, give me just a moment, I'll get my notes. There are four uh, general categories that the General Assembly now requires uh, for this type of evidence to be admitted. The first is that the evidence will help the trier of fact understand the evidence. And Judge, I would submit that certainly uh, field sobriety tests would help the trier of fact make a determination if a person uh, is under the influence of alcohol. The second thing that is required is it must be based upon sufficient facts or data. 
And in this instance, Judge, what I was listening for was any testimony from the trooper that there were studies that have been performed uh, that reached the conclusion based upon sufficient facts or data that a certain number of clues means that the person is above the legal limit. And I, in fact, I asked the trooper what his training was on the number of clues. And he indicated, you heard the testimony, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. He believes that it should be four out of eight clues when the question was, what is the training, which was uh, two out of eight clues. And I acknowledge, yes, that that does uh, in some manner benefit any defendant if he's saying that I'm going to require individually uh, four out of eight clues on this test. But then we get to the next one, Your Honor, and that is that the evidence must be the product of reliable principles and methods. There is no evidence before you that field sobriety testing is based upon reliable principles and methods. You may have heard in other uh, DUI cases what the supporting evidence for uh, administration of field sobriety tests to be admissible in evidence. There's simply no evidence in this hearing, Your Honor, that the performance of the test, particularly the HGN, is the product of reliable principle and methods. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly here, Your Honor, uh, that the expert has been, has, excuse me, has reliably apply, applied the principles and methods. Um, I'd first like to point out, Judge, if you read the statute, it says that the expert has reliably applied the principles and methods. There has been no expert testimony offered in this case to support that field sobriety tests are uh, uh, based on sufficient facts and data is based on reliable principles and methods, and that in this case, the person has who performed the test has reliably applied the principles and methods. In my experience, either the state can establish through the witness that they have the sufficient training and that they can be designated as an expert to say, I followed the principles and methods I was trained with, or they can bring in an instructor, an expert who they can qualify as an expert in this area to establish that they have reviewed the evidence and in their opinion as an expert, and again, this is the, the language that the statute uses, that the, reliable, that the principles and methods were reliably applied in this case. So in the absence of that evidence, Your Honor, uh, there's simply an insufficient uh, uh there, there's insufficient evidence here for you to make a finding that the state has satisfied their burden under 24-7-702. It's not difficult to establish that burden. You just have to call the right witnesses and ask the right questions. But again, here, the same as regards the blood test, there's no blood tester offered. There's no uh, uh, result in evidence. There's nobody from the crime lab here. Similarly, as it relates to the field sobriety tests, the state has chosen, for whatever reason, not to ask those questions of this witness, nor to bring in anyone who could help satisfy their burden under 24-7-702. So on those grounds, Judge, we are asking that uh, the blood test be excluded, the alleged refusal to submit to the ALCA sensor uh, be excluded pursuant to Bradbury and Ammons that I cited earlier, and that the field sobriety test, including the horizontal gaze and stagmus test, also be excluded as the state had the opportunity to satisfy their burden here today, but did not present the necessary evidence to overcome their burden and to make the field sobriety test admissible in evidence. On those grounds, Judge, we ask that you grant our motion to exclude the field sobriety test, to exclude the alleged refusal of the ALCA sensor, and to exclude the blood test from evidence at trial. Nothing further. All right, anything else from the state? Yes, Your Honor. Speaking to the uh, PBT first, uh, the state is aware of the decisions made in Ammons uh, regarding the, admissibility, the inadmissibility of a refusal for PBT and the state is not, and the state is not of the position that it was ever entering that refusal into evidence based on the case law. Um, so that there would essentially be no argument to that mo that motion. However, um, based off a reading of the motions, it appears that the exclusion um, or the motion to exclude is in fact based on the chemical test 
and not the PVT. And um, and so as I again submit that he did agree to the state administered state administered chemical test of his blood and that uh, there is no refusal for the chemical test. And moving to the issue of the blood draw itself, the what defense is speaking to would be the equivalent of a Daubert hearing as it relates to the blood Not draw. Not the equivalent the of a Daubert hearing. It is a Daubert hearing. The new standards require that we have a Daubert hearing. Yes, you, have you read the new statute? I have read the new statute, and my what my point to that would be is that the if if the defense is not in itself questioning whether or not the results are valid, then there is no argument to be made as to whether the blood drawer themselves is sufficient or um, does have well, the necessary. The defense is saying that we don't even have to get to the validity of the actual test if you can't establish that the test was done in compliance with the standards that are established through a Daubert um, examination. If you can't meet the those requirements and standards, then we don't even ever have to get to whether the test was um, whether what the results of the test are, because they go out if you can't establish that they were taken in accordance with the scientific principles that are necessary. Am I mistaken, Mr. Hawk? No, that's accurate. Your Judge, argument. Forgive me. The argument is twofold. You got that correct, Your Honor, under 24-7-702. But let's not forget there's also the requirements of 40-6-392, which are very specific about the blood drawer. Uh, I hadn't gotten to that yet, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, she mentioned Daubert, so I addressed that. But yeah, uh, there the the issue now is that it takes a lot more to establish admissibility um, or to support admissibility than it did prior to the new legislation. And so there's a lot more hoops to jump through. You may have the people, but they have to say the right thing. Yes, Your Honor. And while I understand the requirements of uh, 702, Simply because we are questioning, or simply because the defense is seeking to question whether the person who drew the blood was, uh, or had, had the necessary qualifications or um, the appropriate training, um, Okay, so Ms. Williams, I'm going to end this for you. Uh, unfortunately for you, um, doesn't matter to me one way or the other because I just call them the balls and strikes. But unfortunately for you, the legislature has increased the burden that you have to meet in order to establish the admissibility of um, the field sobriety uh, examinations, the um, blood test, implied consent, all of those things. So um, not just Daubert, but also 40-6-392 subsections. And so because of that, um, you gave me a pre this legislation type of, sub of hearing. Uh, before all this, then you may have been able to go with what I have in here. But uh, now that we have the legislation that increases the burden on the state um, to meet those um, requirements, then I, I don't know that it's sufficient based on the arguments made by the defense. Yes, Your Honor. Um, so um, y'all will get my order. Uh, Your Honor, I did want to address the implied consent, though, before, just for the okay. record. Um, and I just need to clarify, um, I'm not really sure where the idea that there was no sound, because I heard the sound on the video play. And the I didn't consent. hear him read implied consent. I mean, if you're alleging that the 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 uh, tape had audio of implied consent, um, then I can review it when I review this to do the order. But um, 
I don't, I didn't hear him, that he read implied consent. I saw everything. I saw him holding a, car, a card that seemed consistent with a an implied consent card, but I didn't hear it. Okay, and then maybe that was a tech issue because it, it, there is video, there is audio to this. Um, he did read the implied consent card. So um, I, I uh, people on my side heard it, so I didn't realize it, um, that nobody else did. I apologize for that. But okay, there, well, we it have, is in the video. We have it on tape and it's on um it's backed up on YouTube. So we'll look at it. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank y'all. Judge, that's all I have. Me, me and Mr. Turn will be excused. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, Judge. Nice to see you. Good to see you too, sir.